Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Emily and I were eating breakfast when Lori came bouncing into the kitchen, humming a pop tune I didn't recognize. She was wearing a pink velour tracksuit and carrying a gym bag with her work clothes. Have you got time to get something to eat? I asked. No, she said. I'm late for my workout already. I'll grab something when I get to the newspaper. See you tonight, she added with a cheery wave. As she turned to leave, the glitter on the juicy logo on her track pants caught my eye. I grinned at Emily and shook my head. My daughter just rolled her eyes. When we got in the car to begin the drive to the university, Emily reached over and turned off the radio news. Dad, she said, you've got to do something about mom. It's embarrassing to have her dressing like a teenager all the time. Damn, I thought to myself, what do I say to that? The truth was that often Lori's clothing would have been more appropriate on a college co-ed than a 40-year-old woman, but how do you tell your wife something like that? Lori had always looked younger than her actual age, and she worked hard to maintain her appearance. To be honest, that was part of her appeal to me, and I was proud that she was so youthful-looking, even if I too was occasionally embarrassed by some of her clothing choices. Besides, the real issue wasn't her clothing, it was the relationship between Lori and Emily. When Emily was an infant, Lori was always hovered over her, spending time with her every chance she got. But as Emily grew older, their relationship began to change. By the time Emily reached high school, Lori often acted more like she was Emily's sister rather than her mother. I knew that adolescents need to start pulling away from their parents so they can establish their own identities and personalities. But Lori seemed oblivious to this and continued to insert herself into Emily's life. I remembered a time when Emily was a junior in high school and a bunch of her girlfriends had come over to our house. The gaggle of teenagers was laughing and chattering about clothes and boys, and Lori was right in the midst of it all. As I was grading papers in my office, Emily stalked in and demanded, Dad, make mom give me my friends back? Frankly, at times the two of them seemed more like high school rivals than mother and daughter. I tried to get Lori to see that her daughter needed space, but Lori couldn't or wouldn't understand the problem. We're more like sisters, was Lori's comeback, and it's normal for sisters to squabble sometimes. That attitude exasperated me. I felt that Lori was trying to deny the fact of her aging by competing with her daughter. But I didn't want to undermine Lori to my daughter. So for now, I tried to avoid the larger issue by focusing on Lori's clothing choices. Baby, your mom has worked very hard to keep herself in shape and it's natural for her to be proud of what she's accomplished. You have to admit, there aren't a lot of women who can fit into the clothes she wears, I said placatingly. I know, daddy, Emily replied but it's embarrassing to have her wearing the same clothes as my classmates. I understand, baby. I'll say something to her, I promised, but I knew that anything I might say was unlikely to have any effect. Lori had always been headstrong. In fact, that's part of why we married. We'd met in college. I'd been a teaching assistant finishing up my PhD in history and Lori Carlton had been an undergraduate taking one of my classes. I was immediately attracted to her, but I knew better than to make any overtures to an undergraduate, especially one in my class. But she wasn't unaware of my frequent glances and the attention I gave to her because she became increasingly flirty with me. She'd come up to me after almost every lecture to ask a question, batting her eyes and frequently touching my hand or arm. She'd sit in the front row in the lecture hall with her skirt hiked up high enough to give me a good look at her gorgeous legs and sometimes a hint of lace. It was almost as though she was trying to break down my reserve. Nevertheless, I held out until after the semester was over, and then I asked her out. The sexual tension between us had built up so much that by the time she had come back to my tiny apartment after dinner, we were almost panting. When I turned around after locking the front door, she grabbed me and began kissing me frantically. I responded in kind, and that seemed to raise her desire even higher. She took both hands and yanked on the front of my shirt sending buttons flying in all directions. I tried to unbutton her blouse, but she fell to her knees and began tugging at my belt. But getting those off over my shoes proved too much for her, and in frustration she yanked my pants back high enough that I could walk and then pulled me over to the couch. She shoved me down on my back, and while I was struggling to shed my shoes and pants she reached under her skirt. Without further ado, she swung one leg over me, impaled herself, and began. It didn't take long for both of us to finish, and when we did she collapsed on me, 
panting like a runner who had finished a marathon. I was equally exhausted. I'd never experienced passion like that and I was blown away. Instead of burning out, over time our relationship deepened into something more lasting and encompassing. By the time she was ready to graduate, I knew that she was the woman I wanted to build my life around. So when she took me down to Savannah to meet her parents, my intention was to ask her father for permission to marry his daughter. When we got to Lori's home in Savannah, we were greeted at the door by Cecily, Lori's little sister, who threw her arms around Lori with greeted me happily. Cecily was an oops baby, born some 16 years after Lori. Perhaps as a result, Lori had been a combination of second mother and role model for her baby sister. But if Cecily's greeting was warm, her mother's reception of me was chilly and her father's was absolutely icy. All my efforts to win him over were bluntly rejected. Rufus Carlton was a wealthy attorney prominent in Savannah society, whose plans for his daughter didn't include marriage to some left-wing starving intellectual type. I tried to reassure him that a. I considered myself a political independent and b. I had already managed to secure my first teaching position at a university in Atlanta. Neither argument made the slightest difference. Rufus had already plotted a course for his daughter's life, centered around marriage to a suitable candidate from the local landed gentry. I was simply not good enough in his eyes. I was angry at her father's high-handed rejection, but Lori went absolutely ballistic. That's when I learned how headstrong she truly was. Even though we had intended to spend a long weekend with her family, after a private talk with her father she stormed out, grabbed her bags and demanded that we return to Atlanta immediately. On the drive back, I found out a great deal more about her stormy relationship with her father. Lori might have been the older, but she behaved more like a second child, always rebelling against the limits her father sought to impose. They were like oil and water, except that not only did they not mix, they couldn't even coexist anywhere near each other. I'll be damned if I'll let my father run my life, she said vehemently. When we finally got back to my apartment, she grabbed my shoulders and said almost angrily, Do you still want to marry me? When I eagerly affirmed that I did, she said, Good, let's go. With that she dragged me back to the car and drove us to the Fulton County Court Clerk's Office, where we obtained a license and got married on the spot, thanks to the absence of a waiting period in Georgia. The upshot of Lori's act of defiance was that when he found out what she had done, her father cut off all contact with his daughter. There were no communications on birthdays or at Christmas. Even the birth of a grandchild was unable to break the ice. Moreover, the freeze extended to the rest of the Carlton family as well. Early on, Lori did get a letter from her younger sister, but it consisted mainly of a plea for Lori to beg her father's forgiveness. That Lori would not do. Over the years I tried several times to re-establish relationships because I thought family was too important to write off like some bad debt but my overtures were ignored. There was no doubt in my mind where Lori had gotten her stubborn streak. Lost in those memories, I was startled to realize we had reached the campus, so I headed toward the bookstore. I'd pulled a few strings and managed to get Emily a summer job there. As she opened the car door to get out, I grabbed her arm. Hey, what time do you want me to pick you up this afternoon? She hesitated a moment, then turned back to smile at me. You don't need to get me, Daddy. I've got a ride home. I tried not to frown, but I could feel my gut clinch nevertheless. I was morally certain that her transportation would be provided by her boyfriend, Brandon Hilton. It's natural for a father to feel protective of his daughter, but my doubts about Brandon went beyond the normal paternal reservations. He was a third-year law student, and it bothered me that someone so much older would take an interest in a freshman. I knew that many upperclassmen target new, Coeds the way wolves prey on newborn lambs. Similarly, I had seen many inexperienced girls, just out of high school and eager to experience life on their own for the first time, get their hearts broken. But I felt a law student ought to be looking for a woman closer to his own age to start a life together, not pursuing a girl still in her teens. His interest made me extremely leery. But Emily was clearly crazy about him, and Lori, who had talked to Brandon at some length one time when he came to pick Emily up, had no reservations. So I swallowed my protests and simply said, Okay, baby, I'll see you at dinner tonight. From there I headed over to the history department, still dithering about my daughter. I was under no illusions about her innocence. 
I was pretty sure that the little creep she dated during her last two years of high school had taken her virginity. But both Lori and I had held some frank discussions with her, and Lori had quietly arranged to get Emily on the pill, so at least she was protected in that regard. Still, I couldn't help wishing that Brandon Hilton would just disappear and let my daughter find someone closer to her own age. Sighing, I arrived at my tiny office and began going through the administrivia that colleges require even for their summer sessions. But the drudgery of that task couldn't keep my enthusiasm from growing as I began to think about the course I'd be conducting. I'd managed to persuade the chair of the history department to let me offer an upper-level elective on the same subject on which I'd written my doctoral thesis, vigilantism. My hypothesis was that vigilantes had played a larger role in history than is generally recognized, and that they represent a difficult moral dilemma for society. For example, American lore is filled with stories about the loner and who is forced to seek justice on his own. We Americans are usually sympathetic to such figures and find them appealing. To illustrate this, I plan to show the class excerpts from Death Wish, the Charles Bronson film about an architect who is forced to turn vigilante after his wife is murdered because the police can't find the criminals. In juxtaposition, I'd also assign the class to read The Oxbow Incident, Walter Van Tilburg Clark's classic Western short novel about a posse that strings up some cattle rustlers only to learn their captives were innocent. My first class went well. The students seemed to grasp the moral and societal dilemma and I know they appreciated seeing the violent movie clips. History doesn't have to be boring. So I was in a good mood when I got home that afternoon, and I stayed that way until the front door slammed and I heard Emily running up to her room in tears. The door to her room was closed, but I could hear her crying within. I knocked. Can I come in, Emily? Okay, Daddy. I heard her mumble, so I turned the doorknob and entered. Our daughter was lying sprawled face down on her bed her back rising and falling with her sobs. I sat down beside her and pulled her into my arms. She didn't resist. In fact, she clung to me just like she had when she'd been a little girl with a scraped knee. Her tears wet the front of my shirt. I ached for her obvious pain, but a part of me was gladdened that she still needed her dad. What happened, baby? I asked, raising her chin so I could see her face. Brandon dumped me. She managed to get out before her crying resumed. Oh, baby, I'm so sorry, I told her, but I wasn't being entirely honest. If Brandon Hilton was out of her life, that was just fine with me. I knew I couldn't say that to her, however, so I just held her and stroked her back, trying to soothe her while she wept. After a while, I heard Lori come in, and I hoped that a little feminine perspective might help. Leaving Emily in her room, I hurried downstairs to consult with my wife. We had a little tragedy today, I explained to her. Brandon dumped Emily, and now she's inconsolable. Good, was Lori's response. It's about time. I was startled. I'd expected a little more maternal sympathy. But I thought you liked Brandon, I replied. He wasn't right for her, was Lori's sharp response. Don't you want to say something to her? I asked uncertainly. It's best to leave Emily alone right now. She'll get over it soon enough. Girls do at that age. I was surprised. I'd thought Lori would be the one who was nurturing and sympathetic. Instead, it seemed like I was to play that role. Once again, I mentally shook my head at the mystery of mother daughter relationships. I hope you're right, I said, and let the matter drop. My reservations only increased when Emily never came down for dinner that evening. The next morning, she did eat a little breakfast, but she promptly got sick to her stomach and went back to bed. I let the bookstore manager know she was ill and hoped that Lori's assessment was accurate. The next day, Emily made it into work, but she still wasn't eating much. She completely turned her nose up at the idea of breakfast. I began to wonder if she might have picked up some form of stomach flu, but she told me she was okay so I let it go. It was clear to me that she was still deeply upset by the sudden breakup with Brandon, but Lori seemed to be right. She was doing a little better. That assessment held only until Friday. I stayed late at the office that day trying to get some extra work done so I wouldn't have to work over the weekend. As a result, I didn't get home until almost 6 p.m. After setting my laptop down in my office, I went looking for Lori and Emily. The door to Emily's room was closed, and once again I could hear crying coming from within. I knocked gently and then opened the door to find Emily in tears again on her bed. When she looked up at me, 
Sorrow was mixed with fear on her face, and for a second I actually thought she was going to run away. But then her shoulders slumped, and she suddenly launched herself into my arms, crying even harder. Baby, baby, what is it? I implored. What's happened? She kept her face buried in my shoulder for another minute, then looked up at me with an agonized expression. Oh, daddy, she sobbed. I'm pregnant. I felt slightly lightheaded, and I turned and plopped down beside her on her bed. I was so shocked and dismayed that I could hardly think, and I heard myself asking the two stupidest questions of my life. Are you sure? I gasped. Then, realizing what a dumb question that was, I topped it by babbling. How did this happen? Fortunately, Emily was so upset that she simply responded to my inane questions. I did one of those home pregnancy tests yesterday, and it was positive. So I want a student health today, Daddy. The doctor there told me I'm about six weeks along. But you've been taking the pill, I protested. You can't be pregnant. I know, she sobbed. That's what I told the doctor. But she told me the pill isn't 100% effective and that I must be one of the unlucky 1%. I clutched her to me, and at that moment I think both of us were wishing she was still a little girl and this was all a bad dream. We sat that way for quite a while, not speaking, just holding one another. Finally, I eased my grip so I could look at her again. What does your mother have to say about this? I asked. She doesn't know yet, Daddy. Mom hasn't come home yet. I was irritated with Lori. Of all the days to be late, this was one time when I really needed her advice and perspective, but I pushed my irritation to the back of my mind because I knew my daughter needed me. I glanced at the clock on her nightstand and saw that it was after 7 o'clock. It's getting late. Let's go downstairs and see if we can get something to eat, I told Emily. We walked together to the kitchen and found some leftovers in the refrigerator we could heat. After we'd eaten a little, I asked her, Have you spoken to Brandon about this? Her face clouded up again. I tried to call him today, but his number has been disconnected. His landlord said he's left town, and he didn't leave a forwarding address. About what I would expect, I thought nastily, but I didn't say anything aloud because I didn't want to upset Emily further. So I asked the question that had been weighing on me most heavily ever since I'd learned of her condition. Have you thought about what you want to do next? I deliberately phrased the question ambiguously but Emily knew exactly what I was asking. Oh, Daddy, I don't know what I want to do. I'm not ready to be a mother, and having a baby would really mess up going to college for me. But I just don't think I could, end it. More tears leaked down her cheeks. Although her next words were low, they were resolute. Daddy, I think I want to have the baby. I went around the table and hugged her. If that's your decision, honey, your mother and I will support you any way we can. We'll get through this. Emily looked up at me. I love you, Daddy, was all she said, but it was enough. I sat back down and we finished our dinner. Another glance at the clock showed me it was now after 8 o'clock. Where in the world was Lori? I tried to call her cell phone, but it must have been turned off because my call went straight to voicemail. Then I tried to call her office at the newspaper but got no answer there either. Finally, I decided to try Jackie, her best friend, but when I reached her, Jackie told me she hadn't spoken to Lori in several days and knew nothing about any plans Lori might have had for the evening. When I hung up, Emily looked at me with concern. Is everything okay with mom? She asked. She must have had some meeting or interview to go to tonight. She probably mentioned it to me and I forgot all about it, I reassured Emily. In truth, I was pretty sure there was nothing on Lori's calendar that would have kept her late today, and I began to get worried. But I didn't want to alarm Emily. She had enough on her mind already. So she and I went in the den and turned on TV. One of those talent search programs was on. So she and I passed the time making snide comments about the acts and the judges. By the time the program was over, Emily was half asleep, and I encouraged her to head on to bed. You've had a pretty tough day, I told her. And you could probably use a little extra sleep. I'll let your mom know what's going on when she gets home, and we can talk some more tomorrow. Emily went to her room but I stayed up waiting for Lori. Where was that woman? The sun coming though the den windows woke me up and I groggily realized that I had fallen asleep on the sofa. I quickly got up and checked our bedroom, but Lori wasn't there. Just to be sure, I checked the garage, but her car was still missing. Now I was really worried. I tried her cell phone again with no better luck. 
There was no answer at her office either. After some searching, I found a home number for her boss at the newspaper. His response was even more disturbing. Lori had come into the office on Friday but had left at midday, saying she had a meeting. She hadn't returned. I'd never had to look for someone who'd gone missing, and I really had no idea what to do. Increasingly anxious, I began calling local hospitals to see if they had admitted any patients who matched her description. No luck finally in desperation I called the police department. It took a couple of transfers, but finally I spoke to a desk sergeant who told me that they had no reports of any accidents or unidentified victims of foul play who matched Lori's description. All right then, I said, how do I file a missing persons report? You can't, the sergeant told me. Not until the person has been gone at least 72 hours. When I began to protest, he cut me short. Look, the most likely scenario is that something came up unexpectedly and your wife didn't have time to tell you about it. We can't mobilize the whole police force every time one spouse forgets to tell the other about their plans. The fact that her car is also missing makes that scenario highly likely. But if your wife doesn't show up, I've already made a note of your call, so the clock is now ticking on the 72 hours. And if you can give me the make, model, and license number, I'll have our guys keep an eye out for her car, just in case. I gave the sergeant the information and thanked him for his time. I couldn't believe Lori would go off somewhere without at least phoning to let me know where she was, but I couldn't think of anything else I could do to help find her. The only thing left was for me to try my best to keep Emily from getting too upset. The rest of the day, I called everyone I could think of to see if anyone might have a clue where Lori had gone. No one could offer any suggestions. I even thought about calling down to Savannah, but, given our history, I just couldn't imagine Lori going there. The entire weekend I felt like Emily and I were in prison because we were afraid to leave the house for fear that Lori would come home and we'd miss her. We felt cut off from the rest of the world. The phone rang a few times, but each time it was only a concerned friend hoping for good news. Loneliness, anxiety, and depression were our only companions. On Monday Emily was still having morning sickness, but she found that if she avoided eating or smelling breakfast cooking she could escape the worst of it. Accordingly. I switched to cold cereal, although I still brewed a pot of coffee. I encouraged Emily to go to work at the bookstore, if for no other reason, than to try to get her mind off her mother for a bit. Finally, she agreed to go. I dropped her off, but returned home to wait. I didn't have a lecture until 1 p.m. About 10 a.m. the phone rang, and to my surprise it was the same police sergeant with whom I'd spoken on Saturday. Mr. Manning, have you heard from your wife yet? He wanted to know. I let him know that I had not. Very well. It's been 72 hours, so we're going to activate your missing persons report. Can you come down to the station to help us fill out the forms? Of course, I told him. I'll be down right away. When I got to the police station, a detective from missing persons took me back to his desk. I thought I had given the desk sergeant all the necessary information, but the detective wanted a lot more details. After almost an hour of questions, I thought we were through but I was wrong. The detective looked up at me casually and said, by the way, I believe we've located your wife's car. What? I said, startled. Where is it? Actually, it was on the top floor of a parking garage near the campus where you teach, he said. He paused to let me digest that and then went on. Are you sure you didn't see your wife on Friday? No, I said without hesitation. Not since we had breakfast that morning. Very well, Mr. Manning, that's all for now. I felt a bit defensive. Can I have the keys to my wife's car? The detective shook his head. Oh, no. Forensics is checking it for clues. You know, fingerprints, blood stains, that sort of thing. That shook me, badly. Could something terrible have happened to Lori? The next few days were terrible. I was haunted by the idea of Lori being kidnapped and molested. Or worse. I remembered how irritated I'd felt when she hadn't come home that night, and I was ashamed of my unkind thoughts. At the same time, I did my best to cushion Emily. Her nerves were already on edge as a result of her pregnancy. Losing her mother had made her almost hysterical. Her fear for her mother's safety was now compounded by an intense paranoia for her own safety and that of her unborn baby. Lori's disappearance had shaken us both to the roots of our being. Then it got worse. I got a call from the missing persons detective asking me to come down to the station. When I got there, 
I was taken to a small room where another detective was waiting. The first detective introduced her as being with homicide. When I heard that, I thought I was going to faint. I collapsed into a wooden chair and managed to gasp out, Have you found Lori? Is she? No, the female detective said. We haven't found her, but we have found out some important information. We've checked with the airlines and the bus companies. None of them has any record of a woman matching your wife's description traveling on that Friday or Saturday. We've checked with your bank, and there have been no withdrawals from your joint checking or savings accounts. And we've checked with the credit card company, and there have been no charges on her account. So we don't have any answers yet, Mr. Manning, but we do have a number of questions for you. I was startled. Me? Why? I've told you everything I know about Lori's disappearance. She looked at me coolly. The last place your wife was seen was driving away from the newspaper in her car, which we subsequently found in university parking. We've been all over her car, Mr. Manning. The only fingerprints we've found besides hers were yours. How do you explain that? I was dumbfounded. What is there to explain? I've ridden in her car and even driven it a number of times. Of course my fingerprints are there. How good was your relationship with your wife, Mr. Manning? Any quarrels over money? Infidelity? Anything like that? She demanded. Suddenly things began to click into place. Are you asking me if I had anything to do with my wife's disappearance? I can't believe this. I'm the one who reported her missing. The detective crossed her arms. That's not unusual in a case like this, she said calmly. A case like this? I gasped. Are you charging me with a crime? Do I need an attorney? She gave her partner a quick glance. If you feel you need an attorney, Mr. Manning, you're certainly welcome to get one. But I haven't done anything, I yelled. My wife is somewhere out there in danger. You people should be out looking for her, not badgering me with stupid questions and innuendo. Calm down, Mr. Manning, the first detective said. We're simply trying to look for possible motives behind your wife's sudden disappearance. You're the logical person to start with, wouldn't you agree? Don't you want to help us find her? Still upset, I sat back down in the chair. Of course I do, I said sharply. Okay, what do you want to know? Were there any issues between you and your wife, Mr. Manning? No, I said assertively. Nothing at all, she asked. Not a single disagreement? Well, nothing major, I said. What kind of minor issues, she pressed. We had the same kind of arguments as any couple married 20 years, I said. You know, like differences about how to raise our daughter. She leaned across the table toward me. Have there been any disagreements recently regarding your daughter? Mr. Manning? Any events or new situations affecting her? I slumped in the chair. Unwed motherhood is not the shameful event it once was. Nevertheless, I found myself embarrassed to talk about it. Yes, there has been one. Detective. My daughter is pregnant. The two exchanged glances. The man spoke up quickly. And what was Mrs. Manning's reaction when she learned of your daughter's condition? Before I could respond, the woman jumped in. Could that have been what caused her to run away? Could she have been upset by the news? Did you argue with your wife about what happened? Did you do something to her in the heat of an argument? I jumped to my feet and angrily leaned over the table toward the woman. The male detective quickly grabbed my arm and pulled me back into the chair. Calm down, Mr. Manning. Calm down. He shot the woman an evil glance. My partner got a little carried away there. We're just trying to explore every possibility. I took a deep breath and tried to relax, but the detective didn't release my arm. I kept my eye on the woman, who had backed away nervously. Listen, you witch, I said fiercely. The only person I love more than my wife is my daughter, and I'd die trying to protect either one of them. For what it's worth, Lori didn't even know about our daughter. The night I learned about my daughter's condition was the night Lori didn't come home. I looked back over my shoulder at the detective behind me. I've had about as much of these insinuations as I can stand for one day. Unless you're going to charge me for some crime that I didn't commit, I'm leaving. That's fine, Mr. Manning, the detective behind me said, relaxing his grip and pointing me toward the door. We don't have anything more for you at this time. He pulled the door open for me. However, we may need to ask you additional questions at a later time. I started out the door, but he stopped me. One last thing, Mr. Manning. Don't make any plans to leave town anytime soon. 
I glared at him and stalked out. The door closed behind me and I heard angry voices. As I drove home, I was so angry that I was shaking. But when my adrenaline levels began to fall, I began to rationalize what had happened. Of course, they have to check out every possibility, I told myself. But that didn't make me feel any better. I'd done nothing but try to find my missing wife. I couldn't even think about the accusation that I might have harmed Lori without my blood pressure soaring. Why would she even suggest such a thing? I barked angrily. Of course, when I got home, Emily wanted to know what I'd learned from the police. I didn't want to upset her any further, so I simply told her that they had no new information, but just wanted to double check some details. Afterwards, I thought bitterly, now I'm starting to lie to my own daughter. What a damned mess. The next day brought a new indignity. The police came to our house with a search warrant. I had to sit on the deck for two hours while they rummaged through the house, poking into every corner, crevice and nook. I'm not sure what they were looking for, but whatever it was they didn't appear to find it. I used the time to call an attorney. It sure looked like I was going to need one. If that wasn't enough, when the police got ready to leave a tow truck pulled up in our driveway and hauled away my car. They promised I could have it back in a couple of days, but since they still had Lori's car I was forced to ask my neighbor to take me to a rental place so I could have transportation. The only blessing was that Emily wasn't around for that ordeal. But neither she nor I were able to escape what happened next. Two days later I opened the local news section of our newspaper to find the following headline. Husband, a person of interest, in local woman's disappearance. The story rehashed Lori's disappearance and added the information about the search warrant and the tests performed on my car. The story never said as much in so many words, but it clearly implied that foul play was likely and that the husband, me was the most likely suspect. Emily was in tears when she read the story, and I called my attorney in a rage. Isn't there anything I can do to stop this? They've practically already tried and convicted me, and they don't even know if a crime has been committed. I want to sue for libel. My attorney did his best to calm me down. John, I've already looked into this. If I had to guess, the police may have planted the story to try to put pressure on you. But you'll never be able to prove that because reporters don't have to reveal their sources. As for libel, there are no factually inaccurate statements in the story. It's just the way they're presented that's so damning. Remember, Lori has a lot of friends on the newspaper. You're just going to have to hang tough on this till it plays itself out. Sinuvowicz. I swore to myself helplessly. When I went into my office at the university that day, I found a note on my door asking me to see the chairman of the history department. Once I got to Henry Vance's office, his secretary ushered me in right away. He got right to the point. John, in light of all this business about Lori, we think it would be best if someone else took over your summer session until the matter is settled. Henry, I said, Lori is the one who's missing, not me. Sure things are pretty difficult for me, but there's no reason why I can't continue the course. Of course, he said, of course, but with this cloud over you, it looks bad for the department and bad for the university if you continue to teach. You understand, don't you? I jumped to my feet. Oh, I understand. All right. I understand that you'd like me to disappear even though no charges have been filed against me and although there's no proof that a crime has even been committed. Henry, you're a professor of American history, for God's sake. Don't you have any appreciation for the concept that a man is considered innocent until proven guilty? He had obviously not anticipated that I would object, and he was taken aback. I felt I had the advantage and I pressed on. Isn't it ironic that I'm teaching a course on the role of the vigilante in history, and here you are ready to conduct an old-fashioned lynching? Good Lord, John, that's not what this is, he sputtered. Oh, it's not? Very well, you tell me, I went on. Is the Chancellor ready to back you up if I refuse to go? Have you already run this by the Faculty Senate to see what they think? Because unless you have checked, and unless you've been given express authority to remove me, I'm going to be back in that lecture hall this afternoon teaching my course. And if you try to stop me, I promise you I'll raise such a stink that you'll be the one they'll be asking to step down. He sat down abruptly in his chair, and I leaned over his desk. I love this university, and I would never do anything to hurt its reputation. That includes not giving in to some misguided notion of frontier justice from someone who is neither authorized to act nor knowledgeable about the facts. 
With that I turned and marched out of his office. I wondered if someone from security might be waiting for me when I went to the lecture hall for my class, but the only people to show up were my students. Interestingly, attendance was perfect. I guess it helps to have a celebrity lecturer, I thought wryly. I had planned a lecture on a comparison between vigilantes and terrorists, but I decided to skip that discussion and talk about myself. I figured everyone in the class was aware of my situation, and I thought that what was happening to me might prove instructive. So I started the discussion by sharing the events of the last two days, including the news story about me and my encounter with the chairman of the history department. I began by reading the newspaper article about Lori's disappearance. So here's a question for you. Can the news media ever become a vigilante? Is there a line between factual reporting and provocation? When I got an objection to this proposition, I asked them to review the role William Randolph Hearst and his newspaper chain played in inciting the Spanish-American War. Hearst never fired a shot, but most historians cite him as the spark that ignited that conflict, I told them. And what about Chairman Vance of the History Department? I asked. Was he acting in good faith as the responsible protector of the university's reputation, or as a vigilante who decided to act on his own without proof and without authority? We had a great discussion, and most of the students were reluctant to stop when the class was over. I didn't like what was happening to me, but at least I had been able to use it to make my course content more immediate to my students. It was a teachable moment, as they say. Even though I heard nothing more from the university administration, the newspaper article had still taken its toll. When the initial news story about Lori's disappearance ran in the paper, Emily and I were flooded with calls of concern from friends and neighbors offering sympathy and suggestions, or just calling with words of encouragement. In fact, after a while, there were so many that I wanted to let the calls go to the answering machine. I felt helpless and frustrated because there was nothing I could say to the callers. Of course I couldn't do that because I was still hoping against hope to hear from Lori. But after the second article, the concerned calls dropped away to almost nothing. It was as though we were in quarantine with some infectious disease. Now our friends wanted to have nothing to do with us. It felt as though I was the victim of whatever had befallen Lori. Because we'd become so isolated. I was caught off guard when the phone rang one evening several days later. The caller was the one person I never expected to hear from. My father-in-law, Rufus Carlton. You scumsucker, he shouted as soon as I spoke into the receiver. What have you done to my daughter? I took a deep breath and decided to try to be civil. Good evening to you too, Rufus. In answer to your question, none of us know what's happened to Lori, and we're doing everything we can think of to find her. Don't give me that crap, he fired back. When a wife goes missing, it's always the husband who's responsible. I knew you were trouble from the moment I met you, but Lori wouldn't listen to me and turned her back on her family because of you. But she's still my daughter, goddammit, and I'm not going to let you get away with this. I've got people working on it, and we're going to string you up and stretch your neck before all this is over. Do you hear me? I couldn't contain my anger any longer. I hear you very well, Rufus. And you know what? You didn't know me when I courted Lori, and you damn sure don't know me now. As for Lori, all I can say is that you have a funny way of showing your love for your daughter by cutting her off without a word for 20 years. As far as I'm concerned, if we don't hear from you for another 20, it will be too soon for me. With that I slammed the phone down, hoping I'd burst his eardrum in the process. Then I dropped into the armchair, shaking in anger. I was sick and tired of being tried in absentia and condemned for deeds I hadn't done. In the meantime, my wife was missing and I missed her terribly. Worse, I knew that every day that went by lessened our chances of ever finding her again. It was enough to drive a man insane. Fortunately, one thing that helped me retain my sanity came from an unlikely source, my daughter. Several days after Rufus's call, she came to me with a request. Daddy, I want to go to a Lemaz class to learn more about the childbirth process. But I really need a partner, and I don't have anyone else to do it. Will you go with me, Daddy? Of course I agreed. So a few nights later we found ourselves in a conference room provided at one of the local hospitals. There were about a dozen couples with us, and the women were at various stages of their pregnancies. A couple of them looked so far along to me that they made me nervous something might happen that night. An attractive red-haired woman who appeared to be a few years younger than I came up to greet us. Hi, welcome to the Lamas class. 
I'm Bridget Murphy, and I'll be leading the class. As I looked her over, Emily introduced herself to Bridget, who spoke with her briefly and then invited Emily to go meet some of the other expectant mothers before the class got started. Then she turned to me with a smile and said, And you are? I hadn't been paying close attention and I stuttered, Oh, I'm John Manning. Um, I'm the father. Immediately, Bridget's smile transformed into an unfriendly frown, and I blushed when I realized what she thought. No, no, I said hastily. I mean I'm Emily's father, not the father of the baby. Her face relaxed. Well in that case, welcome to the class. Sorry to have leapt to conclusions, but I've seen stranger things in the maternity ward. So where is the father of the baby? I frowned myself. Unfortunately, he took off for parts unknown. So I'm going to be Emily's partner in all this. Bridget smiled warmly at me. I'm sorry to hear about the father. It's unfortunate how often that happens these days but I think it's great that you want to be here for your daughter. Not every dad would be willing to help out. I glanced around to see that Emily was eagerly chatting with some of the other mothers-to-be, so I decided to be candid with Bridget about our situation. I wasn't happy about what I had to say, but I wanted to lay my cards on the table so there wouldn't be any embarrassing moments later. There's something about me you ought to know, Bridget, before we get started. I don't know if you've read about it in the papers, but I'm the John Manning whose wife disappeared. I had nothing to do with it, but if you saw the news story, you might think otherwise. Anyway, if you're uncomfortable with my being here, I'll try to make other arrangements. She looked at me calculatingly for a moment and then broke into a small smile. You're here for your daughter. That's all that matters to me. Besides, in my experience, cold-blooded killers rarely attend Lama's classes. Now, we need to get the session started. I had gone through Lama's with Lori before Emily was born but I have to admit that I had forgotten most of what I learned. Nevertheless, I tried to be supportive and Emily was very pleased with the first class. She seemed to develop a rapport with Bridget right from the start, which really helped. Getting out of the house and, more importantly, getting out of my head to focus on Emily was a real blessing for me. The stress of coping with my anxiety about Lori on the one hand and my anger with those who believed I was the cause of her disappearance on the other had been worse than anything I had endured in my life. The chance to forget it all, even for an hour or so a week, was a lifesaver. Although the calls from friends and neighbors stopped once suspicion fell on me, that wasn't the end of all outside contact. I was stunned the first time I answered the phone and someone I didn't know began to spew invective at me for having murdered my wife. After that, from time to time I'd find hate mail from anonymous writers condemning me to perdition for what they said I'd done to Lori. There were even those who wrote to tell me they knew how I had done it and where the body was buried. If that wasn't enough, I even got an offer for money from one of those supermarket tabloids if I would confess to their reporter. As a result, I almost threw away the handwritten letter with no return address that I found it in the mailbox one afternoon. But I did open it, and when I began to read it, I almost fell down. John, I just saw the news story about you in the local paper. I am so sorry I never imagined that anyone would think that anything had happened to me, much less that you could have done something terrible. Please let the police know that I am alive, and well, and living with the man I love. Go ahead and file for divorce if you haven't already. I won't be coming back. Don't try to find me. This was something I had to do. Please tell Emily I still love her despite what I've done to her. Lori. Emily walked into the room at that moment, and when she saw my face, she cried, Daddy, what's wrong? I held out the letter to her. It's from your mom. She gave a little scream and took the letter from me with trembling hands. When she had read it, she began to cry piteously and collapsed into my arms. How could she do that, Daddy? How could she leave us like that? She didn't even say goodbye. As I held Emily in my arms, I remembered a time when she was very young and had wandered out of our backyard. We almost went mad with fear when we couldn't find her, and were on the verge of calling the authorities when a neighbor brought her back to us. I distinctly remember the conflicting emotions I had. Relief that she was safe and anger at her for scaring us half to death. I felt the same welter of emotions now. Relief that our long nightmare was over and rage at Lori's selfish betrayal of her family. It was Emily who recovered first. Daddy, we need to take this letter to the police right away. Of course I realized that she was right, so I want to get my wallet and keys. When I returned to the den, 
She was just coming out of her room. I'm going with you, she said determinately, and I wasn't about to argue with her. We were in this together. As we drove down to the station, Emily nervously fingered the letter we'd received. She looked over at me with concern on her face. Are you going to divorce mom, daddy? I felt like Emily was in a fragile state and I didn't want to upset her any further. So I merely said, well, I need to talk to the attorney and see what he says. But she interrupted me. I really think you should, daddy. I really do. I hated to see the split between Emily and her mother, but Lori had brought all this on herself. She had abandoned Emily every bit as much as she had thrown me over for another man. Emily was old enough to recognize it and to be able to deal with that reality, however painful it might be. She reached out to me, and we held each other's hand for the rest of the way to the police station. I hadn't even thought to call ahead, but fortunately we found the detective we had dealt with from missing persons on duty. When he took us back to his desk, I asked him, where's your partner from homicide? Somewhat reluctantly, he went to get her. Ever since our confrontation at the station house, she'd been absent whenever the police talked to me. When she arrived, I took the letter from Emily and threw it on the desk in front of them. This came in the mail today, I said curtly. The male detective opened the envelope and quickly read the letter. He glanced up at me and silently handed it to the woman. When she'd finished, she looked up at me. You could have written this yourself, you know? I could feel my anger rising, but I held myself in check. Sure I could have, and I could have flown up to New York City to mail it to myself, or haven't you noticed the postmark? She started to reply, but, to my surprise, Emily interrupted her. And before you go accusing my father of forgery, I brought along an old letter my mother wrote me when I went to camp. You can see it's her handwriting. The first detective took Emily's old letter and held it up beside the new one. His partner peered over his shoulder. They glanced at each other, and then the first detective looked back at me. We're going to have to turn this over to the lab to confirm, but it looks to me like our missing persons case has been solved. He held out his hand. I'm sorry about all the suspicion, he said, but we had to check. Reluctantly, I shook it. But when the female detective offered her hand, I turned my back and Emily and I walked out. I guess I was naive. I'd expected there would be some sort of official notice that the case was closed, but there was nothing of the kind. Yes, I was no longer a suspect since no crime had been committed, but my reputation had been stained and there was no absolution for my non-existent sin. I had to get my attorney to call the newspaper and make a veiled threat before they'd even run a news story. When they did, all I got was a couple of paragraphs buried at the bottom of the last page of the local news with the headline, Missing Wife Case is Runaway Spouse. I was practically front page news when everybody thought I'd done away with her. I protested to my attorney, now that I'm exonerated, all I get is a few lines. How is that fair? He shook his head. Unfortunately, that's the way it goes, John. Mysterious disappearances and possible murders are news. The mundane truth doesn't sell newspapers. I'm sorry, but this is all you're going to get. I gnashed my teeth, but I knew there was nothing I could do to change the situation. In desperation, I photocopied the brief story and sent copies to everyone I cared about. I dropped a copy off on Henry Nance's desk, and he at least had the courtesy to look embarrassed and mutter congratulations. I even wound up laminating a copy of the story and sticking it in my wallet so I could pull it out and show people whenever the subject came up. Sadly, I think a lot of people preferred the fiction to the true story. The one thing I didn't do was to send a copy to Rufus Carlton. Let his high-priced detectives find out what his daughter has done. I thought to myself, all this did have one positive outcome. Once the police had authenticated the letter, I had no difficulty filing for divorce on the grounds of desertion and obtaining a speedy judgment in absentia. That settled any possible legal questions and put me on the road to being single once again. Soon I hoped I'd be able to get on with my life. Throughout the whole process, I'd continued to go with Emily to Bridget Murphy's Lamas class. Emily became quite close to Bridget, and several times the three of us went out for coffee after class. Bridget's story was a sad one. She'd married her college sweetheart right after graduation and right before he was deployed to Afghanistan to fulfill his ROTC commitment. She'd gotten pregnant while he was on leave, but he died in an IED explosion before he even learned the good news. To compound the tragedy, Bridget had miscarried soon afterward and lost the baby. 
She also lost the ability to have any more children. Such terrible circumstances would have overwhelmed many people, but instead of abandoning herself to despair, Bridget somehow found the wherewithal to devote herself to helping others. She went to back nursing school and specialized in obstetrics so that she could help other women have their babies. The Lamaze classes she taught were one manifestation of her commitment. I was amazed at her fortitude and surprised at her ability with the young mothers. One time I told her, speaking as a professional educator, I have to say how impressed I am with your ability to teach these women a skill that doesn't come naturally. You have a real gift. She blushed and told me that it was only because her class was so motivated. But I knew that it took more than motivation to make for good education. Emily and I were driving home from class one evening when she surprised me with a question. Did you notice what Bridget was wearing tonight? She asked. I couldn't have told Emily what outfit Bridget had been wearing, but I had noticed that she had exchanged her nurse's scrubs for regular clothing. And she was wearing makeup too, Daddy. Oh, I said dully. Well, that's nice. Don't you see? Daddy? She's dressing up for you, Emily said in exasperation. Why would she do that? I asked, uncomprehendingly. Emily shook her head in wonder at my stupidity. Because, Daddy, she likes you. I think you should ask her out. It's about time you got back in the game. Once my divorce had become final, I'd thought about dating again but hadn't done anything about it. After all, our friends were all married, and I didn't know any single women. Oh, sure, the campus was filled with them, but they were mostly all Emily's age. There were lots of reasons why I didn't want any involvement of that sort. But Emily wouldn't let it go. And at the close of the next class, I nervously approached Bridget and asked if she'd like to go out sometime. You mean like for coffee? She asked with a twinkle in her eye. No, I mean like maybe for dinner and a movie, I said uncomfortably. With Emily? She asked, and I could swear I saw a hint of a grin at the corner of her mouth. No, I stumbled on, maybe just you and me. I mean, unless you want Emily to come. That would be okay too. Now she was definitely enjoying my discomfort. No, just you and me would be fine, John. And so I found myself dating again. I was extremely apprehensive about restarting. Not only had I been out of the game for 20 years, but my courtship of Lori had been filled with drama and wild swings of emotion. I was pretty sure I couldn't handle that again. Bridget put all my fears to rest. She was extremely calm and centered emotionally. She intensely disliked game playing and she was self-confident enough not to need to have her ego stroked constantly. In short, she was the anti-Lori, and that helped me to get over the pain and resentment I felt from Lori's abandonment. With Bridget, I found myself able to relax and be myself. I had no intention of rushing into anything hasty, but, truthfully, I was beginning to be able to see myself making a life together with her. Emily's baby was due about the 1st of March, and her pregnancy had gone very well. Even her morning sickness had disappeared after the first month. Consequently, I didn't feel bad about making a day trip to our subsidiary campus in Columbus just before Valentine's Day. It was only a two-hour drive, and before I set out that morning I reminded Emily to call me on my cell phone if anything happened. The drive down was pleasant, and I was able to conduct my business without incident. We had a late lunch, and before I set out on the return trip I decided to check my phone for any messages. To my dismay, the battery had gone dead and I hadn't noticed it. I quickly grabbed a phone at the campus to call my daughter, but I got no answer. That worried me, and I called Bridget to ask her to check in on Emily just to be sure everything was okay. When I reached her, Bridget's voice was not its normal calm tone. Thank God you called, she said. Emily's water broke shortly after you left. She's in hard labor now here in the hospital. Don't take any crazy risks but you need to get back here as quick as you can. In a panic, I jumped in my car and lit out toward Atlanta. Normally, I-85 is teeming with highway patrol cars because of Fort Benning, but I somehow managed to avoid the radar traps and got to the hospital in only 90 minutes. When the elevator let me out on the maternity ward, the nurses quickly gowned me, but instead of taking me to delivery, I was led to a semi-private room. Upon entering the room, all I could see was my daughter lying in bed holding her very own daughter, my granddaughter. I was simultaneously heartsick that I'd missed the birth and overjoyed that mother and baby appeared to be doing well. When my field of vision expanded a little, I realized that Bridget was standing at Emily's bedside with a big smile on her face. 
cooing at the new life Emily was cradling. When Bridget saw me, she smiled broadly and started to step aside. I'll let you be alone with Emily and her baby now, she said, but Emily grabbed her hand. Please don't go, Emily begged. She looked up at me. Daddy, when I couldn't reach you, I called Bridget. She came and got me and brought me to the hospital, and she coached me all the way. All I could do was look at Bridget with heartfelt appreciation. I had no words to express my gratitude. Emily looked at me staring at Bridget and smiled happily. I've decided what I want to name my baby, Bridget Valentine Manning. She turned to Bridget. If that's okay with you, of course. Bridget smiled through her tears. If that's what you want, I'd be honored. Emily turned back to me. Daddy, would you like to hold your granddaughter? It had been a long time since I'd held a newborn, and this one seemed much smaller to me than Emily when she arrived. But as I looked at baby Bridget's tiny red face, I was filled with a powerful emotion, and I made an oath that I would protect and support her to the best of my ability. The circumstances by which she'd arrived in this world were suddenly far less important than the fact that she was here now and needed her family. There is a reason why nature intended for humans to have their babies while they're young. In the next few weeks I was reminded of that by how tired I felt. Even though Emily threw herself into the task, she still needed a lot of help. Newborns demand a lot of attention around the clock, and I went to class on more than one occasion having had little or no sleep the previous night. Emily was a real trooper and didn't complain, but I could tell that she was equally worn out. In addition to having to play with baby Bridget and change her diapers, Emily was also nursing. Bridget reminded me how much energy that drains from the mother. It was hectic but we managed, and as the baby girl grew, we began to settle into a routine, albeit a far different one than before. Once again, Bridget proved to be a lifesaver. She quickly got Emily enrolled in a parenting class that put her in touch with a number of other parents of newborns. By the second month, Emily was taking her new daughter to the class and enjoying the opportunity to get out of the house. It was a day when Emily was off to one of those classes that I heard the front doorbell ring. That wasn't unusual. It was hard for Emily to manage the door with the baby in her arms. So I was all smiles when I opened the door, but I was stunned when I saw who was on the doorstep. It was Lori. From the time I got Lori's letter and learned what she had done, I had thought many times about what I would say to her if I ever saw her again. I had longed for the opportunity to vent my rage, to call her names and demand answers to all the questions she'd left behind. But when it actually happened, I was dumbfounded. I had never expected to see her again, and now that she was here, I was speechless. All I could do was stand there gaping at her. Hello, John, she said warily. May I come in? As if on autopilot, I backed away from the door and she entered and sat on the sofa as though nothing had changed between us. I couldn't help but study her. She was still an attractive woman. She'd gained a little weight, which looked good on her. I guess infidelity and cheating agree with her, I thought bitterly. Yet she also seemed older. There were lines under her eyes and a few wrinkles on her face I had not remembered. Her hair looked like she hadn't paid much attention to it, which was unlike her. At least her clothes were age-appropriate, I realized, remembering how she used to gall Emily with her too youthful wardrobe. You really have a lot of nerve showing up here, I said finally. Believe me, she said in a dull voice. I dreaded this. I know you must hate me. I know how badly I hurt you. My anger was rising, but I tried to control it. I don't think so, Lori. I don't think you have any idea what you've done to Emily and me. Forget about the pain of being deserted by my wife and Emily's mother. Forget the humiliation of being left for another man. Forget about the fact that you went without a word, an explanation, or even a goodbye. Your disappearance made me the subject of a police investigation. They searched our house and impounded my car to look for blood stains. Thanks to you my reputation has been stained. Our friends abandoned me and I almost lost my job at the university. I've gotten crank phone calls and hate mail because total strangers decided I had killed you and hidden your body. There are people out there who would have been willing to lynch me if things had gone on much longer. I had been shouting, and I caught my breath and lowered the volume. So no, I don't think you have the slightest idea how badly you hurt me. As I'd been ranting, her face had grown pale and she'd hung her head, unable to face my anger. When I finished, she looked up and I saw tears running down her cheeks. 
She pulled a tissue out of her purse, wiped her eyes, and said in a low voice, I'm so sorry, John. I had no idea about any of that. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid saying sorry doesn't cut it, I said harshly. I should have sent her away at that moment, but after all those months of wondering, I couldn't help asking, why did you do it? What made you abandon Emily and me? I didn't intend to do it, she whimpered. We started with a little flirting and some sexual innuendo, and the next thing I knew I had fallen in love with him and was in a full-blown affair. He was so exciting, and he made me feel so young. I didn't mean for it to happen, it just did. Oh, yes, I said disdainfully. That's good old Lori. All right. Impetuous and carefree, headstrong and unbelievably selfish. So selfish that you were perfectly willing to throw away your husband of twenty years, not to mention abandoning your very own daughter, so you could pursue your little affair. No, you're wrong, she wept. I hated to hurt you and it killed me to leave Emily, but I just couldn't face her, not after what I'd done. I'd suspected who her lover was, but now I was certain. So you seduced Brandon Hilton. You stole your daughter's boyfriend and ran off with him. What a fine mother you turned out to be. That's not true, she protested. I was trying to protect Emily. I forced Brandon to break it off with her. I knew it was a lie the minute I heard it. No, you weren't trying to help Emily. You forced Brandon to dump Emily to prove you were more desirable than she was. No wonder you couldn't face your daughter. That's just pathetic. She didn't try to deny my accusation. She simply covered her face in her hands and sobbed. But I wasn't done with my questions, not by a long shot. So after you'd won the competition with your daughter, you just decided to disappear, to vanish without a word of explanation, without even packing a bag. It wasn't like that, she said defensively. I left work early that day and went to his apartment to, well, you know. Anyway, when we were finished and lying there, he told me he was leaving town that afternoon. I begged him not to, but he was adamant. He got up to get dressed, and when I saw the suitcase he had packed, I thought, he's dumping me just like he did Emily. Then he turned and said, well, are you coming or not? I realized that he wasn't leaving me, he still wanted me with him. I was ecstatic and crazy about him and, well, I just got in the car with him and we left, she said with a shrug, as if that explained it. I'd known Lori was impulsive, but this was more than I could ever have imagined. You left with only the clothes on your back? I asked in amazement. Her face reddened in embarrassment. Well, I had some of my clothes at Brandon's apartment that I'd taken over in my gym bag, you know, so I could change if I needed to after, um, after sex. That little detail just added to my anger, but I ignored it because I still didn't understand. What did you do for money? You never wrote a check or used your credit cards. I felt badly enough about leaving you and Emily, she said quickly. I couldn't take money you needed to provide for her. By now I realized just how self-serving she was, so I saw through that explanation instantly. No, that wasn't the reason. You just didn't want any of us to know where you'd gone and with whom. You decided to take off on your romantic little adventure, and you didn't want me or Emily or anyone else to find out what you'd done. The expression on her face told me I'd read the situation rightly. But I still don't know how you did it without any money, I went on. Brandon has a trust fund, she said. He has plenty of money. Then her face reddened again. And I had a bank account you didn't know about under my maiden name. I began to pace around the room, trying to control my rage. There was still plenty I didn't know, but I no longer cared about the answers. Each new revelation from her was like a body blow, even after so long. Yes, I'd seen the impulsiveness, the sudden passion and the stubbornness in her. But who could have imagined they would lead to this? As I walked by the front window, I happened to glance outside and saw an unfamiliar car parked in front. I guess that's him out there waiting for you, I snarled. She looked up with a strange expression on her face. No, that's Jackie. She drove me over here. Oh, where's your lover boy? He abandoned me, she said through her tears. One day he told me he had a new opportunity and it didn't include me. Then he left and I was alone in New York. I tried to make it on my own, but it was just too much for me. So he wound up leaving you just the way you left me, I said vindicatively. I guess it's true what they say, karma is a witch. I guess it is, she said quietly. Then she got up, walked over to the window, and motioned to Jackie to come. 
Turning back to me, her voice took on a more urgent tone. I know I was stubborn and impetuous and all those other things you called me. Yes, I abandoned you. And I regret that now with all my heart. And most of all I regret abandoning Emily. But you've got to understand. I had no choice. Of course, I said sarcastically. What mother wants to tell her daughter she stole her boyfriend? That was only part of it, she said quietly. Before I could respond, Jackie came in the front door. In her arms was a baby, and I was momentarily confused. But when Lori went over and took the baby from her, all I could do was gasp, Oh my God! Lori looked at me sadly. Now you see why I couldn't face either one of you. She must have known what I was going to ask because she went on. When I left I forgot my birth control pills, and I had trouble getting a new prescription. Brandon wouldn't use condoms, and I thought it wouldn't hurt, but her voice tailed off. So did he abandon you before or after you had the baby? I asked nastily. Before she could answer I heard the sounds of Emily coming back from her parenting class. As she came into the kitchen from the garage she yelled, Hey, Daddy, whose car is that out front? Then she walked into the living room carrying baby Bridget, only to stop short with a gasp when she saw her mother. I know I could have done better, should have thought of something to say to try ease into the truth gently. But I was so angry at what Lori had done and so stunned by the awfulness of the situation that I turned to my daughter and blurted out, Look who your mother brought with her. Your new half-sister. Then, seeing Lori staring at Emily's baby, I said, Lori, meet baby Bridget, your new granddaughter. It took them a moment to comprehend what I had just said, but then they both began to wail. Of course the babies began to cry, and even Jackie was bawling. For that matter, I felt like crying too, but more than anything I felt exhausted. I certainly didn't have the energy to play referee between Emily and her mother. Whatever Emily wanted to say, I felt like her mother had it coming. Finally, I simply walked out of the room, went into the den and slumped on the sofa. I could hear angry words coming from the other room, punctuated by a couple of anguished cries. I guess that they had just realized that both babies had a common father. There was a lot more crying from both mothers and babies. But after a while I realized that it had grown quiet in the living room and I began to wonder what was happening. I hesitated, but when I finally stuck my head in the door, I saw Jackie holding Lori's baby and Lori holding baby Bridget, with Emily looking over her shoulder. Spotting me, Emily motioned me back to the den and came to join me. I had no idea what to say to my daughter. Lori's revelations had floored me. I couldn't imagine the impact they must have had on Emily. Her own mother had stolen her boyfriend and then given birth to his child. How could I possibly ease the anguish Emily must be feeling? But before I could say anything, Emily stunned me. Daddy, can mom stay at our house for a little while with her baby? You must be joking. I gasped in shock. After all she's done to you and me? I know, daddy, and I don't know if I can ever forgive her for that. But she's dead broke, daddy, and she has no place else to go. Her baby needs a place to live, at least until mom can get back on her feet. Please, daddy. After all, her baby is Bridget's half-sister as well as mine. I shuddered at that realization. Why can't she live with Jackie? I protested. Emily looked at me with exasperation. Jackie lives in a one-bedroom apartment, daddy. Well then, Lori can go live with her parents. She's their responsibility. I tried. Yeah, right, daddy. As if, Emily shot back sarcastically. We tried to shelter Emily from the acrimony of our relationship with the Carltons, but of course she'd picked up on the rift at an early age. We both knew that wasn't a viable answer. I learned two lessons that day. The first was that I would never understand the relationship between mothers and daughters. I had halfway expected a knockdown dragout drag-out fight to break out when Emily learned the full extent of her mother's cheating. For Emily to offer Lori shelter, even temporarily, was beyond my imagination. The second lesson I learned was that it is almost impossible for a father to deny his daughter when she really wants something. I had previously made plans to get together with Bridget the next evening. This was one time when I wasn't looking forward to seeing her. My apprehension must have been obvious because when she opened the door and saw me, Bridget immediately said, What's happened, John? What's wrong? I knew there was nothing to be gained by delay, so I led her to the couch and sat down beside her. Bridget, I have something I need to tell you. 
Lori has come back. Astonishment swept over her face, only to be replaced almost immediately by pain. She caught her breath and then gave a little nod of understanding. And you and she have decided to get back together. No, no, I almost shouted. That's not it at all. I went on to explain all that had happened and how Emily was insistent that I help her mother and the baby out temporarily. Bridget's face relaxed a little, but there was still pain in her eyes as she looked at me. Don't scare me like that again, John. I've already lost one man I loved. I don't think I could stand to lose another. Did she just say she loved me? I'd been feeling closer and closer to Bridget the more we'd seen of each other, but I hadn't been sure how she felt about me. Now, hearing those words, my fears and hesitation seemed to melt away. I took her in my arms and looked into her eyes. I lost a spouse too, but I found another, better one to love. I promise. If you want me, you're not going to lose me. She didn't say anything, but I thought I sensed something building within her as well. Suddenly she was kissing me. I was kissing her and neither of us could stop. It felt as though a dam had broken somewhere inside, and all the pent-up emotions came rushing out and flowed over us. I felt her pulling on me to stand up, and when I did, she began trying to walk backwards, tugging me toward her bedroom. When I comprehended what she was trying to do, I swept her up in my arms and carried her back to her bed. Lying beside each other, we continued to kiss as we slowly began to undress each other. There was no hurry, no sense of urgency, just the certainty that this was the right thing to do. When both of us were bare, we clasped each other tightly, our legs and arms intertwining, wanting to be as close to one another as possible. It's been a long time. We had an amazing sex. As we lay there, each struggling to catch our breath, she gripped my face in both her hands. Thank you, John. Thank you. That was my first time since David died. I thought I would never find love again. I smiled and kissed her again. I felt like my long nightmare was ending too. Our lives now settled into a new, unfamiliar routine. Bridget and I began to spend every chance we could get together, but we decided to continue living apart, at least for the time being. In the first place, we didn't want to rush things. And secondly, I still had two mothers bustling around our house taking care of two infants, plus a busy nanny that Bridget found who now arrived every weekday to help out. She proved to be a godsend because she enabled Emily to continue taking classes and Lori to start looking for a job to support herself and her little one. I still tried to help out, but in truth I was the odd man out. That had an unfortunate side effect. With more idle time on my hands, I began to brood about everything that had happened to me. It might seem contradictory, but the happier I felt with Bridget, the more unhappy I became with Lori. Emily had found a way to coexist with her mother through the shared experience of caring for their infants, but I had nothing to ease the bitterness of my ex-wife's cheating and my resentment of the harm she'd done, not just by cucking me but by disappearing in such a way as to throw through suspicion on me. Over time, however, I found the focus of my resentment shifting to the one person who had thus far escaped the consequences, Brandon Hilton. It was he who had seduced my wife he who had defiled my daughter, and he who had sullied my name, perhaps irreparably. What made it even more galling was that seduction was no longer recognized as a crime. Apparently society was perfectly willing to have predators like Hilton seduce wives and daughters, and then look the other way when they abruptly departed. Shouldn't there be some punishment for all the pain and suffering they left behind? I went back and reread the Oxbow incident. This time I found myself more sympathetic to the members of the posse who had tracked down the rustlers. Yes, they'd wound up hanging the wrong men, but they'd been forced into action by an ineffectual justice system that couldn't protect them. Moreover, as I reminded myself, the crimes those men had attempted to redress were no small matter. Rob a rancher of his herd, and he might not be able to feed his family when the winter snows came howling across the prairie. Steal a man's horse and you all but certainly condemned him to a slow, lingering death by starvation and dehydration, far from human civilization. No wonder the vigilantes took arms against a sea of troubles to go after the ones they believed had wronged them. I realized that Brandon Hilton hadn't put my family at risk of starvation or left me to wander on foot through the desert looking for a waterhole. But he had caused me and my family real, tangible harm. He had stained my reputation, made me into a hapless cuck, 
and left behind two abandoned women. Over time I found myself spending more and more of my spare time searching for clues to his whereabouts, not to mention sleepless nights pondering appropriate forms of revenge for what he had done. Most college professors aren't particularly well paid, especially those in the liberal arts. The loss of Lori's paycheck had significantly reduced our household income, and now I had the added expense of additional mouths to feed plus a nanny to help care for the infants. There was no way I could afford to retain a detective agency to track down my enemy, so I fell back on the poor man's alternative, the internet. Brandon had a Facebook account, naturally, but it had not been updated in over a year. Besides, I thought wryly, he wasn't exactly likely to friend me, so I could follow any activities he might post. A Google search found his name on the class roll of the law school, but little additional information. However, finding that set me off on a visit to our admissions office to see what I could turn up in their records. A friendly administrative assistant let me look at his file. Officially, she shouldn't have done that. But the only thing I learned was that he also was originally from Savannah. That discovery sent a shiver through me. Could Lori have known him from back then? But I quickly saw the absurdity of that idea. She would have been leaving for college when he was only a few years old. That realization caused me to curse Lori again for her foolish refusal to act her age. As my search continued, I found myself becoming something of an expert on the outlandish behavior of a certain daughter of a hotel chain magnate with the same last name. But I had no luck finding Brandon Hilton. He seemed to have made good his escape from the one-man posse on his tail. My lack of success only hardened my determination to find him. A part of me watched my activities in amazement. Just what did I think I would do if I found the man? Fight him. I was no black belt in Eastern martial arts. No unarmed combat expert. Besides, he was 20 years younger than I. He'd surely kick my bum. How did I expect to get satisfaction from him if I even could find him? But that line of thinking did nothing to assuage my anger. He'd preyed on my family, stolen my wife, and broken up our home. He dishonored me and stained my reputation, insults that were unbearable to me. In an earlier era, I knew the answer would have been straightforward. In a matter of honor during the 19th century, the injured party would challenge the other to a duel with swords or pistols. But I knew from my studies that the military was largely responsible for putting an end to dueling. So many duels were fought by soldiers and sailors that the military made it a crime. They needed those soldiers for the battlefield. By the 20th century, dueling was a dead tradition. I knew the history, and I knew the reasons why society so adamantly opposed all such extra-legal action, but I was still left with the same conundrum. How could a man regain his honor without taking the law into his own hands, without becoming a vigilante? So I continued my obsessive solitary search for the man I hated, even though I had never met him face to face, even though I had no plan to deal with him even if I could find him. But none of that stopped me from slipping off to the computer every few days to see if any new information might be found. By the time the spring rolled around, I had almost given up hope of ever finding Brandon Hilton's whereabouts. I was ready to accept that he had disappeared and that I would never see or hear of him again. So I was startled one night when one of my searches actually pulled up a hit from the Savannah Morning News. When I read the story, I was dumbstruck. I immediately called Bridget to see if I could come over to talk about my discovery. I couldn't discuss it with Emily because I didn't want to upset her, and I had no interest in sharing the news with Lori, but I couldn't keep it to myself. I found him, I said excitedly, handing the print out of the news item to Bridget. You won't believe what he's done now. She quickly scanned the article and then handed it back to me. I don't understand, John. I know you hate Brandon, but what does his getting married have to do with you? I couldn't understand why Bridget wasn't shocked by the news, but then I realized that there was no way she could understand the significance. Bridget, Lori's maiden name was Carlton, I shouted. That scumsucker is engaged to be married to Cecily Carlton, to Lori's sister and Emily's aunt. Unbelievable, she gasped. Why won't he leave the Carlton family alone? It's like he has a vendetta against the Carlton women. I hadn't thought about it that way, and I tried to reason it through. No. I said slowly, I don't think that's what's going on. I mean, he certainly knew that Lori was Emily's mother. In fact, he probably got some sort of sick thrill from seducing the mother as well as her daughter. But as far as he knew, they were Lori and Emily Manning. 
It's unlikely that he would know Lori's maiden name. He probably doesn't know that she and Cecily are related. Maybe not, she admitted. But I still don't understand how the Carltons could let Cecily get engaged to him after what he did to Emily and Lori. That's the thing, I said. They don't know either. There's been virtually no contact between Lori and her family since she and I got married. I'm sure they know Lori is alive now, but they probably have no idea who she ran off with. Rufus Carlton probably thinks he's getting a promising young lawyer from Savannah for a son-in-law. If Brandon doesn't know and the Carltons don't know, Bridget asked, then what do you care what happens in Savannah? I shook my head. Brandon may not know that there's any connection, but as far as I'm concerned, he's back again. He's like a thief who robs your house and then comes back later to rob it again. He owes me, and this time I'm going to do something about it. Bridget got a worried expression on her face. John, what are you thinking? You're not going to try something foolish, are you? Violence never solved anything. I didn't say it to Bridget, but as a historian I knew that old saying wasn't true. Think violence never solved anything? Tell that to the Carthaginians after Cato goaded the Romans into conquering their army, slaying all their men, enslaving their women and plowing salt into their fields to make nothing would grow for seven years. That pretty well settled the issue for Carthage, I thought. But I didn't want to alarm Bridget, so all I said was, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't stand idly by and watch this happen. Now that Brandon Hilton's whereabouts were no longer a mystery, my mood only darkened. The possibility of revenge was no longer a fantasy. Now I had to resolve the dilemma of what to do. I'd always been a believer in the law. As a historian I knew all too well what happened when individuals took the quest for vengeance into their own hands. But after what had happened to me and my family, I simply could not sit by idly and let that man get away with his predations. My pride, my honor, and my sense of justice all demanded a response. Brandon Hilton had to pay for what he had done. Finally, after a long, sleepless night, I made my decision. Once I had finally done so, I found I was able to devise a plan to get satisfaction. I didn't have a lot of time, but I thought I could do what needed to be done if I hurried. I now began to use the internet to research the steps I would have to take and to acquire the resources I would need to accomplish my objective. One by one I tracked them down. During this time I was often away from home running errands in pursuit of my quest, but I hoped that caring for two babies would distract the others enough that they wouldn't notice how busy I was. The last thing I needed was a lot of questions and second-guessing. But both Emily and Bridget could read my mood, and finally, just before D-Day, as I called it, they confronted me. I was working on my computer one evening when I looked up to see Emily standing on the threshold to my office with a look of concern on her face. Hi, baby, I said lightly, what's up? Bridget is here, she told me. We need to talk to you. This was unusual. I hadn't planned to see Bridget tonight. I quickly shut down my web browser and started to stand when Bridget walked in the door. She wasn't smiling. Before I could say anything, Emily spoke up. Daddy, Bridget told me that you found Brandon. I shot Bridget a dirty look, but she simply folded her arms across her chest and stared back at me with a determined look on her face. Emily pressed on. Daddy, I'm scared to death that you're going to do something crazy. I know how upset you are with everything that's happened, and you have every right to be. But if you wind up in jail or go and get yourself killed, that's only going to make things worse. Bridget stepped up and put her arm around Emily's shoulder. Please, John, Emily's right. Whatever it is you're planning, don't do it. I've already lost one man to senseless violence. I couldn't bear it if that happened again. I saw the tears in both their eyes, and at that moment, I was tempted to forget about my plans. These were the two women I loved most in the world, and the last thing I wanted was to cause them any pain. But I simply could not call it off. A line from one of the Cavalier poets crossed my mind. I could not love thee dear so much, loved I not honor more. I came around my desk and hugged the two of them. Thank you for caring about me. That means a lot. But you two are worrying about nothing. I tried to reassure them. I'm not about to do something stupid. You know me better than that. Emily looked up at me with hopeful eyes. Promise, Daddy? I had a flashback of Emily as a little girl and I extended my little finger to her. Pinky promise, baby. I swore, and she took my finger with hers and smiled.
But I saw a look of doubt from Bridget, and I knew I hadn't fooled her. I guess losing a husband in battle will do that to a woman. I'd have to be careful to avoid frightening her into trying to stop me. I thought I had done a pretty good job of reassuring Emily, but my efforts were nearly undone when she took a delivery from the UPS man while I was still at school. When I got home, she handed the box to me with a troubled expression. What is this, Daddy? The package says it's from the armory. It's heavy. I knew immediately what it was. I'd ordered it some time ago and had been worried about whether it would arrive in time. It's nothing, baby. Just a gift for a colleague in the history department. I lied. She didn't say anything more, but I could see the doubt on her face. That night I was in my office double-checking the driving directions when Lori startled me by walking in the room and closing the door. I'd made it very clear that I was not happy about having her and her baby in our house, and up to now she kept her distance. Well, what do you want? I asked coldly. She just looked at me for a moment. Then her face turned red and she began to cry. I know I've hurt you badly and been unfaithful and made you suffer and… She stopped to choke back a little sob. And I know that I have no right to ask anything of you, but… Again she had to pause before she could go on. It's just… Please don't get yourself hurt or thrown into jail or anything over me. I've done enough to you. I just couldn't bear it if I was the cause of even more pain for you. Or Emily. Or even Bridget. I sat there unmoved. That's your trouble, Lori. You always think that everything is about you. Well, this is not about you. It's about me. I'm doing what I need to do. You opted out of my life and you don't get to come back into it, now or in the future. Understand? Her face turned pale, then she turned and swiftly retreated. After a minute's thought, I reached into a drawer in my desk and pulled out the copy of the wedding announcement in the Savannah Morning News. I folded it and put it in an envelope. Then I packed everything I would need. Tomorrow was D-Day, and I wanted to get an early start. I awoke early the next morning, and after showering and shaving I took my bags and tiptoed to the kitchen to get a little breakfast before hitting the road. I had just finished my second cup of coffee when Emily walked in holding her baby. She spotted my suitcase immediately and looked up at me querulously. Where are you going, Daddy? She asked uneasily. I'll be back late tonight or early tomorrow morning, baby. I told her. Where are you going? She asked again and I could see her anxiety rising. It's fine, baby, I promise. Everything's going to be okay, I told her, kissing both her and her baby on the forehead. Before she could speak, I reached into my pocket and handed her the envelope I'd sealed last night. Do me a favor, baby. When Lori gets back from work this afternoon, please give this to her. Now there was real fear in her eyes, but before she could say any more, the baby started to cry and while she was tending to it, I used the opportunity to slip out the door. As I pulled out of the driveway, I wondered whether Emily would wait until Lori got back before she read the announcement. That made me think, and I reached into my pocket and turned off my cell phone. I didn't want to speak to anyone until I'd done what I had to do. It's about a four-hour drive from Atlanta to Savannah, so I got into town a little past noon. After a fast food lunch, I checked into a cheap motel to rest and change clothes. After all, I wanted to look nice for the wedding. It was still springtime, but Savannah was already hot and humid. There was a breeze off the ocean, of course, but it did little to bring down the temperature. I put on the dark wool suit I'd brought with me. It was unremarkable, but perfectly acceptable to wear to a wedding. That was fine with me. I didn't want to be noticed, at least not now. The air conditioner in the car kept me comfortable on the ride over to the cathedral, but as soon as I'd parked and began walking toward the entrance to the cathedral I began to sweat. I checked to make sure my suit coat was buttoned. The wedding was by invitation only, but no one ever checks the invitation list. I waited until a knot of guests walked up the steps and fell in behind them. I even made idle conversation with a couple as we waited for the ushers to escort the ladies to the pews. When asked, I told the usher I wanted to sit on the bride's side not because I gave a damn about the Carlton family, but because there were more people seated on that side of the aisle. Better camouflage, I thought. The cathedral made a lovely setting for a wedding. The high peak of the nave was impressive, and lilies and white roses overflowed the altar. The bride was lovely in her long white gown as she walked down the aisle on her father's arm. That old reprobate was beaming at the congregation. I made sure to turn my head away as he walked past my pew. The wedding mass was traditional, 
The priest even asked if anyone present knew any reason why the loving pair ought not to marry. I was tempted to speak, but held my peace. The setting wasn't right for what I meant to do. After the wedding, the entire congregation adjourned to the country club for the reception. I waited until most of the parking lot had cleared out before following, not wanting to stand out in any way. The reception was being held in the main dining room of the club. Rectangular tables had been set up in a line along one wall to form an extended head table. The rest of the room was filled with round tables, each big enough to seat eight. The tables were arranged in a semicircle so as to leave an open area for dancing. At a guess, I figured there were 60 tables. I'd have a nice audience for my performance. I found a table in the back of the room that wasn't filled and took a seat. Must be employees or distant relatives, I thought. The other exiles at the table were glad to have company, and we began a desultory conversation about the wedding, the reception, and how much Rufus must have spent. This must be costing him a fortune, one woman told me breathlessly. He actually got Paula Dean to cater the whole thing. I believed her. The food was very good. If this was to be my last meal, I thought, at least it was an enjoyable one. After dinner, the wine glasses were removed and replaced with champagne flutes. I knew what that presaged, and my stomach tensed up. I had only sipped at my wine through dinner because I wanted to have a steady hand. But I did accept a flute of champagne, not to drink, but as a prop to help set up my performance. The sound of Rufus Carlton's meaty finger tapping on the microphone called our collective attention to the main table. After some fulsome words about his daughter and her new husband, Rufus opened the microphone for toasts. There followed a procession of friends and relatives, each of whom felt compelled to share some marginally humorous anecdote about the bride or the groom. After each toast there was laughter, applause, and more consumption of alcohol. As the ritual wore on, I got up and edged my way around the room to the side of the head table. After a few more offerings, things began to quiet down and the best man asked, as I'd hoped, anyone else? I raised my glass and in a loud voice exclaimed, I have a toast. Because I was standing to the side, it was difficult for most of those seated at the head table to see me. I didn't think there were many people in the room who might recognize me, but I wanted to take no chances. As I made my way up to the dais behind the honorees at the head table, I could see that most of the audience was paying no attention to me. That will change, I thought grimly. I took the microphone and cleared my throat loudly. I wanted to get people's attention, but my throat was suddenly dry anyway. It was time to start. We've heard a lot of anecdotes about the past so far tonight, but I want to talk about the future for Mr. and Mrs. Hilton, I said in a falsely jovial tone. And by the future, of course, I mean children. That brought a laugh and a few whoops from the crowd. I predict there are going to be lots of children in this couple's future, I went on. Now I can't speak for Cecily, but I can definitely vouch for Brandon's ability in that area. There were a few more laughs, but a little murmur arose from the audience, and I noticed several people look at each other questioningly. I spoke a little louder. I can say that with certainty because Brandon has already fathered at least two children that I know of. I heard a gasp from Mrs. Carlton, and immediately the audience began to buzz. Rufus Carlton turned to stare at me full on, and suddenly a look of recognition dawned on his face. You're John Manning. You weren't invited to the wedding. Get off the stage. Brandon had been sitting there beside the dais in a slightly inebriated haze, but when he heard my name, something must have connected with him, and he started to rise. I quickly leaned over put my hand on his shoulder, and roughly shoved him back down in his seat. Some quick-witted soul killed the microphone, but that didn't faze me. I had taught freshman history to a class of 300 in an auditorium, so I knew how to project my voice. I have more to say, I said loudly. Rufus yelled again for someone to get me off the stage. To my right I spied several younger men. They must have been friends of Brandon, trying to make their way through the tables to do just that. I was prepared for that. I reached down, unbuttoned my suit jacket, and pulled back the left side to reveal the shoulder holster I was wearing. With my right hand I pulled out a .357 Magnum with an 8-inch barrel and waved it at the advancing men. There were screams from the audience, and the men backed away hastily. Mr. Magnum and I have a few more words to share with you about Brandon Hilton, I said loudly, keeping my left hand on his shoulder. He looked up at me and his eyes were as wide and as white as the wedding cookies we'd been served with dessert. 
As I was saying, Brandon Hilton has already fathered at least two children. I went on, would you like to know with whom? Turning to Rufus, I snarled, the first one was by your other daughter, Lori, and the second one was with your granddaughter, Emily. I heard a shriek from the bride, and I turned toward her mercilessly. That's right, Cecily, I shouted. Brandon is not only the father of your sister's baby, but also your niece's. The poor girl burst into sobs. I felt a little sorry for her because this girl had never been unkind to me, but I couldn't say the same for the rest of her family. I turned back to Brandon. You've always screwed around with whomever you wanted to. Another man's wife, her daughter, it didn't matter. And you've always gotten away with it, haven't you, Brandon? But not anymore. With that, I reached up, grabbed Brandon's curly blonde hair and yanked back, exposing his throat. At the same time, I put the magnum down on the podium, reached for the scabbard beneath my jacket on the right side and pulled out a bowie knife. I'd wanted to make an impression and the huge knife with a blade fully, as long as the barrel of the magnum certainly succeeded. I heard more screams in the audience as I bent down over Brandon. When he saw the bowie knife in my hands, he instinctively threw his arm up to try to protect his face. That gave me just the opportunity one wanted, and I slashed the knife through his hair, cutting off a thick handful. Quickly I sheathed the big blade, and then pulled out a plastic bag and thrust the hair sample inside. That should be a sufficient sample for the DNA test, I told him and the rest of the crowd. When he realized that I wasn't going to slit his throat, the young man slumped in his seat. As I looked down, I could see a dark stain spreading through the crotch of his pants, but I wasn't finished with him yet. I reached into my jacket pocket, pulled out a packet of papers, and thrust it into his hands. Brandon Hilton, this is legal notice that you are being sued for paternity of the child you fathered with Lori Carlton Manning. You are hereby served. I reached into my jacket again and produced a second packet. Brandon Hilton, this is legal notice of a paternity suit in regard to the child you fathered with Emily Manning. You are hereby served. I looked down at him with disgust. Don't even think about trying to disappear again. I've already notified the Georgia Department of Child Welfare. They have a thing about deadbeat dads, and as soon as the court makes it formal, they'll be all over you to collect, no matter where you go. I yanked his head up again. You want a prediction about your future, Brandon? I predict that for the next 18 years, or so you're going to do very little except work to pay child support for your children. With that, I scrambled across the table and onto the main floor. But before I left, I turned toward the old man. He stared up at me with a mixture of hate and despair. Congratulations on your new son-in-law, Rufus. I told him with a sneer. You sure are an excellent judge of character. I heard a kind of primal scream from behind me, and I looked over my shoulder just in time to see Brandon make a grab for the massive handgun I'd left lying on the podium. He hoisted it, aimed it at me, and frantically began pulling the trigger. I shook my head. Don't bother trying to shoot me in the back, Brandon. It's not a real gun. It's a replica. Then I laughed. Why don't you keep it? Consider it a wedding present from me. With that I strode for the door as the commotion behind me reached hysterical levels. People in the audience were yelling at each other. Cecily and her mother were weeping in each other's arms, and Rufus was yelling at Brandon. At that moment, in a bizarre but strangely appropriate decision, the bandleader picked up his baton and instructed the musicians to play. I smiled as I walked out the door. Too bad they didn't play nearer my god to thee, I thought. That would have been the perfect conclusion to this shipwreck. In all the confusion, no one came after me. Or maybe it was just the memory of the Bowie knife still swinging from my belt. In any event, I managed to get to my car and drive off without further incident. Once I was out on the interstate heading north, the adrenaline began to wear off and I began to shake. Then an enormous tiredness came over me. I thought about stopping to sleep, but it was more important to me to get home. For sure, I thought. I didn't want to be arrested anywhere near Savannah. I rolled down the car windows to let the cool night air could blow over my face to keep me awake. As I drove, I thought about what I'd chosen to do. If I had killed Brandon Hilton, I would have wound up in jail, leaving my family destitute. Moreover, I would have deprived the two babies of the support that Hilton would soon have to start paying. I guess in one sense I had become a sort of vigilante, but I'd done it my way, within the law. I'd gotten a measure of satisfaction from Brandon Hilton without committing violence. 
except to his hair, I thought with a smirk. I'd made sure that he would pay for what he had done and keep on paying till both those babies became adults. My daughter could certainly use the money to raise baby Bridget. And with any luck, the extra income would help get Lori out of my house that much quicker. As a bonus, I'd also managed to give Rufus Carlton his comeuppance. And if my little stunt had caused him to waste a ton of money on a fancy wedding, that was just gravy as far as I was concerned. Whatever happened now, I felt good, like a heavy weight had been lifted off my back. It was well after midnight when I finally reached our neighborhood in Atlanta. I was planning to try to be extra quiet when I went inside so as not to awaken anyone, but when I pulled into the driveway, the lights on the main floor were all on. When I started up the front walk, the door burst open and Bridget, Emily, and even Lori came running out with tears streaming down their faces. Emily was the first to reach me, and she fell into my arms sobbing. Oh, Daddy, I was so scared. Then Bridget caught up and began trying to hug me while simultaneously beating my arms and chest with her fist. Don't you ever do something crazy like that again, John Manning? What if they'd attacked you? What if someone had brought a gun? I gathered the two of them in my arms and led them back into the house. The two women wouldn't let me go, and all three of us tumbled onto the couch in exhaustion. When Bridget felt the scabbard pushing against her side, she made me pull out the bowie knife and show it to her along with the baggie full of Brandon's hair. I can't believe you took that thing with you, she exclaimed. Then she looked at me quizzically. You do know this hair won't be considered valid evidence, don't you? She asked. I know, I said. The court will order him to give a new sample for the trial. But getting this one was a lot of fun, and it sure made my point to everyone there. Besides, it scared the piss out of Brandon, literally. Then a thought struck me. How do you all know what happened down there? I told them, Lori said quietly. Cecily called me and told me what happened. Cecily called you? You haven't talked to her in years, I said incredulously. I know, Lori said, but she had to call me to find out if what you'd said about Brandon was really true. When I told her everything that had happened, she told me she'd start seeking an annulment tomorrow. I nodded. I was glad to hear the news. Tears were still streaming down Lori's face. I know you didn't do it for me, John, but thank you for saving Cecily from that monster. It's going to be very hard on her for a while, but at least she learned the truth now rather than later. Thank you for saving my little sister. I nodded again. I'd done what I'd done for my own reasons, but I still felt better knowing that Cecily's life wouldn't be screwed up by that amoral scumsucker. Despite my fears, the police never did show up at our house that night, nor the next day either. I thought for sure that Rufus would come after me, but apparently he directed his rage at Brandon instead. Life for that young man went downhill fast. As she had told Lori, Cecily sought and obtained an annulment for her wedding, arguing successfully that Brandon had withheld vital information from her. Meanwhile, at the trial for the two paternity suits I'd filed, the court ruled that he was indeed the father of both Lori's and Emily's babies, and it awarded both women appropriate child support. With his vital statistics on record with the Georgia Division of Child Support Services, Brandon Hilton became a marked man. The wedding reception became the tale of the year, and although the guest list totaled only 500, thousands of Savannans claimed to have been there to witness the debacle. Not surprisingly, Brandon left town shortly afterwards. I heard that he now holds a low-level government job with the city of Macon. What really surprised me was that Rufus Carlton apparently helped him get the job. I guess Rufus decided that Brandon's having a job was in the best interests of everyone concerned. Of course, after making two child support payments every month, Brandon doesn't have a lot of discretionary income left over. Cecily and Lori continued to stay in touch with one another, and ultimately Lori moved back to Savannah. I guess without me Rufus was willing to welcome her back into the fold. Or maybe he realized that banishing his daughter hadn't been such a wise move after all. Either way, her departure was a relief to me. After all that happened, I wish I could say that I forgave her, but that would be a lie, and I was glad to have her out of my life. Emily is still living at home, but she wants to find a place of her own soon. She's gotten a good job here in Atlanta and is taking classes at night towards her college degree. She's also recovered enough to start to re-establish a social life. Being a single mother doesn't make that easy, but Bridget and I are happy to babysit, and that helps. Yes, Bridget and I got married in a small, private ceremony. 
She told me after my vigilante adventure that she wasn't going to let me out of her sight, so I decided to accept the inevitable and make it legal. Now that my personal excursion into vigilantism is over, I've decided to write a book on the subject. Hopefully in the future my only involvement with those who want to take the law into their own hands will be academic. However, it seems that there's one potential vigilante still left in my life. My new wife took the Bowie knife and had it framed and hung over our mantle. She's warned me in no uncertain terms that if I ever pull a damned fool stunt like that again, she'll take it down and do some surgery I'll never forget. I think she's kidding, but I don't intend to risk finding out. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.